Good morning, and welcome to Bower Hill Community Church. If you will follow along on the bulletin that was emailed to you, that would be helpful. Also, I would remind you that this is Communion Sunday. Therefore, if you can find some bread and some juice, uh, you will be able to take communion with us as we go forward. Let us join together now in the call to worship. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. When I consider your heaven, the work, your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, who are we that you are mindful of us? Creator of heaven and earth, thank you for creating and loving us in a way that knows no limits. We acknowledge you as Lord and praise you for all creation. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this time of praise and worship. Please, Lord, shape us, mold us in the disciples of Jesus Christ that you are calling us to be. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Amen. The good news is that Christ calls us to new life and enables us to begin again and again. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Oh, mm-hmm. 
Again, we are glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. We would remind you that you should have gotten an e-blast from the office that we are trying again this Communion Sunday to have a virtual coffee hour. So we hope that you will take part of that and engage in the discussion and see your friends and neighbors virtually. Also, Brian is on vacation for the next two weeks. So I will be preaching both this week and next week, and then Brian will return. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture reading is from Matthew, Chapter 11, verses 16 to 19, verses 25 through 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise, and the intelligent have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Will you join with me now as we responsively read the 27th Psalm? Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, 
for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will seek the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. Our second scripture this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. It's a rather difficult letter. It is Paul explaining his anxiety as he's under persecution. Hear now Paul's letter. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find to be the law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Will you pray with me? O Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. What is it like to be rejected? Have you ever been labeled a nerd? Or maybe that's not the term that's in vogue these days. But when I was in high school, I was certainly the poster child for nerd. Pocket protector, slide rule, corrective shoes. In gym class, it was always one of those times when there would be a pickup. So if there was 12 people The one side would pick five, and then the next one would pick five. And then when it came to the sixth, the one team would say, go ahead, take Fred, we'll play with only five. It didn't feel good to be rejected. I thought maybe I could focus on what I really enjoyed and do best, which was really science, electronics more specifically. So while others were out playing softball and catching a football, I was in the basement wiring little transistors and resistors together. I tried to allow that to make me feel accepted, but it still hurt. I was a nerd and somewhat proud of it. Our social nature all of us, is to want to fit in, to be somewhat like everybody else. Look at the clothing we choose. I would venture to say that during this pandemic, several of you have gone through your closet, looked at things and said, oh, I can't believe I ever wore that. It's so out of style and gave it perhaps to goodwill. Or maybe it was the wideness of your tie or the the narrowness or wideness of your suit coat lapels. 
Or most interestingly, throughout the pandemic, when salons have been closed, at many virtual meetings, it was hard to really identify some of the women because the hairstyle and maybe the color had changed dramatically from what we knew it to be. For the most part, they were a little embarrassed. They didn't want to not fit in. Some of us even drove to Ohio so we could get our hair cut so that we didn't look like something right out of the bush. Maybe it's your neighborhood, the color you've painted your front door, the flowers you've planted alongside your walk. Somewhere there is within us that burning desire to fit in, to not be rejected. Now there's some other things that maybe we we spend a lot of time thinking about before we act. Maybe a discussion has come up about politics. And a friend of ours begins to say some things that either we don't agree with or we know are just not true. And we'd like to respond. We'd like to say, oh yeah, yeah, I I hear what you're saying. I agree with you. But then we remember what our mothers told us a long time ago. If you you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. And even more so, if the discussion turned to religion, my hunch is we were even more uncomfortable. The last thing we wanted to be known as was some Bible-thumping extremist. And so... Perhaps that's why even when we issued a call for people to come on the evangelism committee, uh, we didn't have any takers because people were afraid they would get painted with that brush. And now that we're in this thing called the pandemic, at each day, and sometimes two or three times a day, we get conflicting information on what we should do. Not only to fit in, but that to protect our own health. Now, I don't know about you, but we have encountered very close friends who are completely opposite in their understanding of what we should do about the pandemic. There are some who are really on the extreme side that believe they need to bring their groceries, put them into the, and of course they order them online, and bring them into the garage and let them sit for at least three days before they touch them. They have rubber gloves, they have masks, and they are very cautious and careful. But on the other side, we have those that early on abandoned wearing face masks and can't understand in this heat why Why would you continue to do that silly thing? They have forced their way into some retail stores and told them, we don't have to wear masks. That's silly. Our society during this pandemic has seemingly begun to drive even a deeper wedge into those thoughts that we have, especially as to whether we're on this side or this side, and whether or not we may be accepted. Being outside of acceptance is difficult. In the gospel lesson that you heard today that Amy read, John comes out of the wilderness, and he is rejected. It's easy for them to reject him. I mean, The man's wearing camel's hair. He's eating locust. Who wouldn't reject this guy? But then Jesus comes along, the son of a carpenter, not a rabbi, not particularly learned. 
he begins to talk about the hierarchy and why some of the things that they require is perhaps not right. He rejects the establishment. He rejects their anti, their position, negative, against tax collectors, the Pharisees, anybody that otherwise society would call an outcast, Jesus seems to embrace. Even to the allegory, again, in today's gospel, when he said, it's like the children played the flute and you did not dance. Or they wailed and you did not mourn. When we listen to the words of Paul, confusing as they are, it seems to be a war and anxiety going on between his head and his heart. Now, more than ever, we've become a society of strongly diverse understanding. Our personal experience, our individual history, is very powerful in shaping us. I was reared in a community where there were two blacks. One was a delivery person for the drugstore. The other was Simi the barber. In my 12 years in school, there was not one black student. Not one black athlete on any of the teams. We were a pure white community. But in spite of that, my head, I felt for sure I was not prejudiced. Several years later, my brother at the time was working in Montgomery, Alabama. And I went to visit him. Now, this would be in the early 80s, way after the Civil Rights Movement. I wanted to buy some batteries for my camera, so I went into a 5 and 10. I was standing in line, and as I looked around, I probably was the only white person in the store. It really didn't bother me. And as I was standing in line with three or four ahead of me, a gentleman, a white man, came from the side aisle at another register and said, I'll take you over here, sir. Without any thought, I walked over, paid for my batteries, and while I was paying for them, an older black gentleman stood behind me. As soon as I was done with my purchase, the clerk said, I'm sorry, sir, this register is closed. All of a sudden, prejudice became a matter of my heart, not just my head. I saw firsthand how simply the color of someone's skin can mean a different way of being treated can mean not being accepted, can mean being rejected. It's difficult for us to change perspective until our own history is challenged and strained and remade. For if we really admit it, Quite often, we read what enforces what we believe in our head. Whether it is the Post-Gazette or the Tribune Review, the New York Times or the Washington Post, we tend to gravitate to those things that continue to enforce and inform us of things that we believe to be true without sometimes any real heart 
understanding. Unconsciously, maybe we have accepted gross generalizations that have long been a part of our culture. Anyone who is on welfare is lazy. All Asians are pushy. Everyone in Upper St. Clair is obviously wealthy. I'm sure several of you would be glad to say that's not true. Or, if there is a black in our community, we should be just a little bit suspicious. Change is never easy. We have seen protests, some of which became violent, but others which were peaceful with groups from all ages and nationalities and races, proclaiming that it is time, it is time that things begin to change. Their understanding is that simply because there is a law against something doesn't mean that that doesn't happen. Or just because we have not personally experienced that kind of rejection and hurt, it may not be real. Just changing the law is not enough. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, reveals the conflict within him. He was reared a Jew, understood that the law was what made you closer to God. If you followed the law, you did what was right. You certainly were in God's good graces. And if you were unsure, you went to a rabbi, and the rabbi explained it to you so that following the law was enough. But after Paul's Damascus experience, after he says, now I want to follow the Christ, he now has a conflict with a law that says to him, these are the people you cannot be friends with. These are the people you must reject. Paul says, I do not do what I want but the very thing I hate. The law has actually become a burden to him. And he struggles with how to understand it as he himself in Rome is now under persecution. He knows because of Jesus that God is not one to allow people to accept a law that divides rather than unites. A law that excludes rather than includes his understanding of the Christ is to be one that embraces everyone, Jew, Gentile, and even Roman. We have now a unique opportunity to grasp on to a personal experience that could and should change our heart. For since March, we have not been able to go where we want to go. Amy and I were distanced from our grandsons in Washington, D.C., whom we had not seen since Thanksgiving. We desperately wanted to go and see them but we were not permitted. Yet this month, in just a few weeks, our only granddaughter is to be baptized in Houston and we will not be able to go. Maybe it's the first time in your life when you've experienced that situation that does not permit you to move about and go where you want to go. And maybe, just maybe, 
you can begin to understand those for whom that same issue has been true lifelong. Or maybe, as you've looked at your IRA statements, through no fault of your own, money that you thought you once had no longer is there. And there's an economic downturn that nothing you did caused it. Again, have you had any moment of concern or fear as you left your home in the height of the pandemic to go somewhere? A genuine fear that you too would become ill? Yes, this could be a tremendous heart wrenching and heart-changing experience for us to realize that whether it's economics or travel or safety, there are those out there who have experienced the same thing that we have had and became frustrated over for only three months, not for a lifetime. It's now time for us to use the experiences to begin to understand what it's like to live in a neighborhood with guns and shooting every day. What it's like to be anxious when you leave your home on what is an ordinary errand, worrying if you will come back. Or what it's like to experience little or no income and wonder what you will do for food. Now, this day is a time for change. It is a time for us to understand that simply sitting at home and saying, yeah, I get it now, isn't enough. Whether we go out and march, whether we write a letter, or whether we engage in a real conversation with those for whom this has not begun to be an understanding. The time to change is now. For when we come to this Lord's table, this Sabbath day, to partake in a rite that is as historic as the church itself, we come to partake of a meal that proclaims everyone is welcome at the table. There is no one who will not be fed. When we are willing to have our hearts as well as our heads changed in order to fully follow the path of the Christ, we will begin to understand. We will have our eyes opened. And we will affirm within us the same struggle that Paul has had until our hearts, too, are changed. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. 
This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Eternal God, holy and mighty, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise and to worship you in every place where your glory abides. You laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but you shall endure. You are always the same and your years will never end. You made us in your image and called us to be your people. But we turn from you, leaving sin and death to reign. Still you loved us and sought us. In Christ your grace defeated death and opened the way to life eternal. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus on the night before he died, he took bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, take this and eat it in remembrance of me. Just in the same way, he took the cup and he poured it out, saying, this is my blood shed for you and for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Remembering all your merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts of you have given us and celebrate with joyful redemption, one for us in Jesus Christ. This sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves and our lives, that they may proclaim Christ crucified and risen the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat and remember him. The cup of Christ poured out for the remission of sins. Drink this and be thankful. Let us pray. Gracious God, may we, having received this sacramental vow, to change our perspective, that we may affirm all people as your children. Open our eyes to all the wrongs that we sometime ignore, and open our mouths to proclaim the way of the Christ. In the midst of anxiety for the future, in our desire for our land to remain free. Grant us a will to conquer our fears, to advocate for justice, integrity, and ultimately the peace that only can come from knowing you. Bind up the hurts, O God, of those that suffer. Bring comfort to those that have lost loved ones and reassure them of your love and care. We know the horror of this pandemic and the disease and death that have visited so many. Be especially close to those that have pledged to care for them and sprinkle your compassion in great measure on those that hurt and calm their uncertainty in the days ahead. We are so mindful of the isolation that have kept so many apart from those they love. Grant them both strength and hope that we may find new avenues for being present once again and share in person our lives and our love and our care for each other. On this Lord's Day, we are bold to pray together the prayer of the Master. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the God that has created all of us, the God of justice, the God of love, go with you this day. Change your head and your heart that we might all be welcomed as his children. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.